Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Is this on? Okay. Hi, Pete. Hi. Let's stand up. What, are you ready to worship the Lord? It's awfully quiet in here. I'm not sure what's going on. Willie, can you get these guys going, please? Yeah. Thank you, Willie. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Well, I know it's early. I mean, not as early as the first service, but still pretty darn early. So uh, we'll give you guys a pass on that as long as you promise to give everything you have in worship to the Lord. Amen. 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 Can we just get everyone to say amen once? One, two, three. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our church family and the fun that we can have. Uh, Lord God, you are, your strength is our joy, and we uh, just appreciate your joy here today, Lord God. Fill us with your spirit. Lord God, we're going to give everything we have to you today in worship. So be blessed in this place, Lord. We lift up your name in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Tell him his greatness, all the good 
says there's no redemption for sin without the shedding of blood. And Jesus has provided that for us. He poured out his life for us, literally poured out his life for us. That's why we're here today, amen? And now we have a hope. Because of what Jesus did, we have that hope that we will have an eternal salvation with him. It's not just hope, is it? It's a fact. Even now, he intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. He has never stopped doing his work for us. Every second of every single day, Jesus is fighting for us. He's our advocate. He's our lawyer. We've been charged with crimes, sin, imperfection. Jesus goes to bat for us. You know he's never lost a case. Amen. We can rely on him. We rely on him for So we praise him. We praise him for pouring out, literally pouring out his blood for us, pouring out his life for us. I encourage you here today, if you don't know Jesus, you haven't experienced this life transforming message of his.
Jesus did.
Thank you. Good morning, Living Grace. How we doing today, guys? Let's try that one more time. Good morning, Living Grace. How we doing? Yes, that's much more satisfactory. I am a boot camp instructor. If I don't get my way, I get a little bossy. So thank you, guys. Um, all right. So welcome to any visitors that we have today. Um, we do have a gift for you in the back. Also, please fill out the Connect card that is inside the um, that is inside and drop it in the tithe box. Um, if you are watching online, hello, those of you online, welcome. Good morning to you guys as well. <coughs> um, we would like to connect with you as well if you're new. So you can fill that out on the website or on the Living Grace app. Tithes and offerings can be given in the tithe box in the back as well or on the app or website. If you would like to give an offering to one of our missionaries, please give directly to them. That's on the Give drop-down. You can specifically donate to <coughs> exactly where you would like that money to be contributed. Um, you can also find that information on the app. Everything's on the app. It's also in the back. Those are the two golden places. Uh, we are taking pre-orders for our winning T-shirt design. Shout out to Steve Osowski for winning that. Thank you. Yep. Good job, Steve. Um, all the proceeds are going to go towards the building fund, so sign up where? In the back. That's right. In the back. Or the app. Yep. Um, you can also email contact at livinggracelv.org to reserve yours today. So please do that because it's going to be the best shirt that you own. Um, a new life group is going to be beginning Thursday, October 7th. This new group, for those of you who would like to deepen your prayer life, will begin with a six-week study through the book Living Victoriously in Difficult Times by Kay Arthur. They will be meeting on Google Meets. For more information, it is on our app. Our Living Grace Family Harvest Hoedown. When you say that, you got to do this. Hoedown. That's right. Correct. Good response. Um, that's going to be happening Saturday, October 30th from 4.30 to 7.30. We are in need of craft and baked goods to sell. So if you are gifted in either one of those areas, uh, please let us know by signing up course at the back table or send us an email to contact at livinggracelv.org. We will also be needing candy to give out. So if you guys would like to contribute to that starting next Sunday, we will have a bin available to start collecting candy. Um, we are in the process of building a new app and website, so that's exciting. And we are in need of pictures. So if you guys have any of those um, of your church family from past events and you would like to share those, you can email them to contact at livinggracelv.org. Also, if you do not want your picture to be posted, please email us and let, that, let us know so we respect your privacy. Um, the new floors are in. We would like to help keeping them looking nice, so please be careful with the chairs or anything else that could possibly scratch them. Do we have any youth in the house? Do I'm supposed to? that need to be dismissed. I don't think I see any. You get to stay, sorry. Um, and that is all of the announcements. You guys are in for a treat because we have one heck of a message delivered by Pastor Richie. So thank you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you. You too. <clears throat> We. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> I heard Mel was doing announcements, so I brought my sport bottle. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank all of you who um, helped us Friday night at the Metro Spring Valley Area Command uh, blessing to the Metro officers and their families. Uh, it was an amazing, amazing time. Um, a couple other churches were a part of it, um, and so it. Um, what the captain said, uh, Captain Nick said that it's it's very very. There's Captain Nick right there, greeting a couple of the UNLV running rebels there. Yeah, 
Uh, that guy's about 6'9", so it's not, we did not play with the uh, photographer. Honey, I blew up the, I, I shrunk the captain. But um, uh, we, um, he said that, that it's very, very seldom that he's able to, that the officers are able to do something with their families all together. Because they do things for the officers, but they seldom bring their families. And so, hey, it was like this amazing time. Um, and uh, yeah, we were just blessed to be a part of it. Why did we do it? Well, a number of reasons. One, we believe everybody's a servant leader. That it takes nothing but a willingness to serve. And the greatest in the kingdom of God is a servant of all. And so uh, we believe that everyone uh, should be serving. Uh, we believe in... Um, uh, everyone's an evangelist, and so for whatever God conversations took place, we trust the Holy Spirit with those with those conversations, uh, and uh, we're 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 happy to be united with other churches in bringing light to the community in any way that we can. Uh, so uh, we put a, we put a a. One of our church brochures uh, inside every bag. The other churches did as well. So I, I went back to the back and I, I saw, whoa, man, someone came by and uh, there's a bunch of flyers missing. And Don said, no, we put them in the bag. I was like, oh, man, you know, but I'll take that as well. So you just never know, right? You never know. And so, so thank you for you guys who came. And uh, it, was, it was an arduous thing, but it was so much fun. And um, also... Uh, I want to uh, make note that there is an event coming up um, uh, later in September. I think it's the 24th. I don't know. But it, October 24th? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's the Thousand Man March. <laughs> yeah, Thousand Man March. And Pastor Aaron Hansel is a dear, dear friend of mine who has a, has a heart as big as this building for the city of Las Vegas, especially when it comes to bringing men together because he believes that men are the miracle. That yes, Jesus is the answer, but, but, it, but men are the miracle. And if men would come into alignment with God and, and God's precepts and, and, the, and the character of Jesus, that a lot of the social ills that we have would, be, would go away because when a, when a man who has a family is, is aligned with God, there's a cascading effect. His, the marriages begin to be restored. Uh, communities uh, begin to change. There's great things that happen. And so the, the, the idea behind the Thousand Man March is to have a thousand men to show up and, and worship together on Friday night and to Saturday, on Saturday to do about a 1.4 mile march uh, to some specific areas to pray, to give, and to, to, to stand up for righteousness and to say, you know what, the, the, the men of God are a force to be reckoned with. And we do believe in holiness and we do believe in righteousness. And so uh, why are we a part of that? One, because of the unity of, uh, of, the, of the city. And uh, uh, th these, are, these are all men that I have great relationships with and I have had over years and so some of the movers and shakers of our city uh, will be a part of that. Uh, it's, it's not about any one person or any one church. Um, uh, I, 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 am not, I am not at all trying to attend another event. I, I'm not a fan of events. But if events are redemptive and if events have a purpose beyond the event, and, and, and then I'm all for it. And so uh, that's another reason we're a part of it. And... Um, so, uh, amen, if uh, there is a sign up in the back, and the reason that we need to know if you're coming or not by October the 8th is so you can get a t-shirt, because you got to get the t-shirt, right? You got to get the t-shirt. You got to. You got to have the t-shirt. Um, no, you can't have a t-shirt if you just don't show up and tell me to get you one. I'm not doing that. No. No, you got to show up, you know, if you want the shirt. But, uh, so anyway, that's what they said, October the 8th, they need to know. So, I leave that with you. Um, these are things that we believe in. Um, we're not just trying to pack the calendar. You have to understand that when we do an event, we always ask the question, why are we doing this? Because the last thing we want to do is be busy about nothing. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So these are things that we think will be very redemptive and that God will use for his glory. So um, yeah, with that, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above all names that the name by which we may enter into the throne of grace and receive grace and mercy. Lord, that at, at the name of Jesus, that, that's the name that we evoke. 
uh, the name that is above all names, that one day every knee will bow, every, every knee will bow, and in every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, you said that the heavens and the earth will pass away, but, but your words will never pass away. In, in your name, Jesus, we come before you and we say, Lord, would you, would you speak by your Holy Spirit? And whatever preconceived idea we have of what you're going to say or how this is going to go or where this may end up, Lord, we cast it aside and we come with a, with a clean heart by the precious blood of Jesus and open ears to hear. Lord, we don't take lightly at all any time your word is being spoken and, and that we can receive from you, Lord. We don't want to uh, uh, fall back or be, be lax or, or we don't want to, uh, oh, it's just a church. No, it's not just a, a church service. It is the body of Christ coming together in the name of Jesus Christ. It's your word going forth and the, and the incredible opportunity that we have to hear from you, even if it's a crumb, oh Lord, we'll take it because we know that, that the slightest that, you, that we can receive can be life-changing. And so God, we give you our full attention. We, our hearts and minds are open to receive from you and your word. Holy Spirit, have your way. We thank you for this opportunity, and we look forward to what you, what you are going to do. Thank you for what you've already done. Now speak, and in, in, we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. We are in um, the book of Ruth, but we're going to start in Daniel briefly. And if you've been with us over the last number of weeks, there's a scripture verse that uh, comes out of Psalm. Psalm 31, 14 says, but as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God, my times are in your hand. And we've been talking about the majesty and the sovereignty and the providence of God and God's ability to arrange circumstances and situations in our lives, even to the smallest, from the greatest to the smallest. And um, on Wednesday night live from the living room that Dawn and I do, and sometimes we, uh, we do it at various places and spaces, we want to get out a little bit more. You know, take, take Wednesday night live from the living room on the road. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, like Newport Beach right there on the pier. Wednesday night live from the li living room. Coming to a living room near you. We were doing this a few weeks ago when it, through our daily reading in the Bible recap that we're doing as a church. If you go to our website, you can find more about that. We were in the book of Daniel. And I was struck once again by the, by the sovereignty of God and his ability to speak and move in the lives of people uh, regarding a, a man named King Nebuchadnezzar who was, who was the most powerful man on earth. Uh, he was the king of Babylon. He was the most powerful man on earth. We cannot, we cannot um, uh, uh, in, in contemporary culture, we can't think of someone with that kind of power. He was, a, he was basically the leader of all the world. Uh, 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 uni, unipolarity, everything was, was all about Babylon. And, um, uh, but he was the most powerful man on earth, but he was not the most powerful man in the eyes of heaven because there was a man named Daniel who had all the cards. And I'd hate to use a vagus expression, but Daniel had the king's heart and the king's uh, interpretation of dreams. And so, so King Nebi has this dream and he's troubled by it. Uh, uh, apparently there's, there's, did I say something funny? What did I say? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I'm thinking, what are you laughing at? Oh, so yeah, King Nebi has this dream and, 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 and he and he doesn't know the interpretation of it, but it, 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 it troubles him. And of course, the, the, the soothsayers and the astro astrologist, astrology, the, the magicians, they have no clue. They, they don't know anything. And they're like, King, you got us. And so Daniel comes forth through interpretation. And the interpretation is basically, King Ebi, you're, you're going to lose everything. Because there's a lesson that God wants to teach you. And it basically says in Daniel chapter 4, that you will, you will dwell with the beast, verse 25, of the field. You'll be made to eat grass like an ox. Y you shall be wet with the dew of heaven for seven periods, which will be seven years, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. In verse 33 of Daniel 4, a year later, apparently Nebuchadnezzar didn't get the understanding. You know, he's like, yeah, whatever, dude. I don't know how he responded to it. He's like, okay. And this is not the first time that God has tried to get his attention. And so God does this to get his attention. Um, 
And he, all of these things are, are fulfilled. Uh, chapter 4, verse 33 says, and then verse 34, there's the, the, the end of the period comes and he says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his... This is coming from a pagan king who, who, ha, who worships himself as God and their own deities in Babylon. The seat of, of idolatry in the world was in Babylon. And he says this, he says, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can, say, can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? Verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. And all of the Nebuchad all of the Babylonian court said, Amen. I mean, because this was incredible, but but it shows the sovereignty of God and God's ability to to speak in in this particular case. He contextualized, it's so gracious of him to speak in a language we understand, and he visits Nebuchadnezzar in a dream and graciously gives him the interpretation of what that means so that he can adjust accordingly. But here's the point that I wanted to make out of that long introduction, is that Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and, and maybe some of the other exiles, were conduits of God's word in a pagan nation. They, they were the ones who brought the word of God to the king, the interpretation of dreams in this context, and said, this is what is about to happen. This is what God has said. That's why Daniel is such an amazing prophetic book, because there are things written in the tables, in the, in the context of Daniel, that I believe are yet to happen. But here's the question. Whenever you see, read, hear about some move of God, you ask yourself this question, and in this context, ask, how did they get there? Oh, they were violently snatched away from their homeland. Uh, when their nation was conquered, they were picked out by, really, God, and they were transported to Babylon and seeped in Babylonian culture. They went through an indoctrination program and, and they chose to stand for the things of God rather to absorb the things of the, of the Babylonian culture which were theirs for the taking. Redemption and lift is a missiologist term that means that when the gospel goes forth, that when the gospel goes forth, there's a lift that takes place. Whether it's a tribe or a, a culture, a people group, or a nation, when, when, when the word of God goes to a place where maybe it, it hasn't been and God visits people even before his word gets there, uh, Don Richardson wrote a book called Eternity in Their Hearts, and it's the story of God visiting people, groups before missionaries ever got there, and and and. and uh, the, the redemption and lift is the gospel goes forth. There's a change that begins to happen. Maybe it's with marriages. Maybe it's some pagan tribal culture like cannibalism or child sacrifice or men with multiple wives or warring factions or uh, uh, all of these issues. And, and the gospel begins to lift that culture, that tribe, that nation, that land until righteousness reigns. God begins to, to capture hearts and there's a transformation that takes place, and that's the, the lift of the redemptive word of God. I'd like to add a word to that and call it suffering, redemption, and lift. Suffering, redemption, and lift. Because if that's going to happen, if the, last, the latter two are going to have, happen, someone has to pay a price. Someone has to be willing to suffer and sacrifice. And I submit to you that in the, in the sovereignty of God, for this pagan king to encounter God, Daniel and the exiles had to suffer the loss of everything to get to Babylon, to be promoted, to have the ear of the most powerful man on earth. What a terrible, tragic event to be placed in, or was it? 
How could anything good have come out of this? Oh, oh, in the economy of God. God is able to redeem the worst of situations and create something of his grace and mercy that would not have been there any other way. Their willingness to stand for righteousness and see beyond their suffering position them to be a blessing. Their willingness to stand for righteousness in a pagan culture that was theirs for the taking. These are young men. They can have the best that Babylon has to offer. And they said no to that. We won't even eat the king's food because we don't want the king to think that we are in alignment with him. And they became a blessing to Babylon. Trials, tribulation, not only shape and form me into the image of Christ, but they open doors of opportunity to be a witness that might not be opened any other way. That's a paradigm shift. It's a way of seeing things differently. Suffering is a seed that can bring forth the fruit of righteousness. St. Francis of Assisi said the the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's redemptive. It's not without purpose. We're in the dark days of the season of the judges. If you've been with us, I don't know, for the last year, <laughs> however long it's been, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. But it's the season of judges. And Judges 21, 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did right in their own eyes. So I want to remind you that the book of Ruth from a timeline is in that timeline. If you were with us last week, uh, no, two weeks ago, because last week Pastor Richard brought the Word of God, and brother, thank you for your heart, and thank you for the message that you brought that's, that touched us and... Yes, I know what you're thinking. Are we supposed to clap or do we not clap or is that okay? Or shoot him a high five later. That's, that's how you do that. Like, it's always awkward when you don't know if you should clap or not. Like, do we clap? Well, are we clapping for the man or for God? What are we doing here? No, just give him a high five and, you know, take him out to lunch. He'll be fine. When you get him, you get his family, though, so it multiplies, you know. You take him to lunch, there's eight people there. You're like, well, the missionary training or something. He calls everything missionary training. I don't get it. Naomi has returned from a season of loss in Moab. She has lost everything. I don't know if you've ever lost everything. There may have been times in your life where you felt like you lost everything. And it's a relative term. In her context, she lost both of her sons, her only two children, and she lost her husband. She finds out there's, that God's visiting the people of Israel, and so she comes back to Israel from Moab. And she comes with Ruth, who is a Moabite, who has committed herself to Naomi, Naomi's people, and Naomi's God. Ruth chapter 1 verse 22 says, Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite is her daughter-in-law with her and returned to the country, who returned from the country of Moab. And, and it, ends, it ends with this, this, this window of bright sunshine in a dark place where it says, now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Famine in Moab. Man. And, and they... And they, and they and they, they come back home, at least for Naomi. She comes back home, back to her people. And, and because there's, there's food, there's, there's sustenance. Moab has been a terrible experience. And she's been there for a minute, but she's, she's on her way home and, and around the people of God and back to her. But she's mad at God. She's angry. She's bitter. And we'll get to that in, in a moment. But she's going home. And I wrote this down. Um, Actually, Warren, I wrote this down from Warren Wiersbe, who said, Before God changes our circumstances, He wants to change our hearts. If our circumstances change for the better, but we remain the same, then we will become worse. God's purpose in providence is not to make us comfortable, but to make us conformitable. Conform to His image and His 
of, of the image of his son, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. So, so God chooses not to work through Naomi. Naomi is bitter, she's angry, she's mad, she's blaming God for everything. But he chooses to work through Ruth. Ruth, who's just glad to be there, who has committed herself to to Naomi and Naomi's people and Naomi's God. Uh, She's she's going to be the conduit of blessing, but doesn't even know it yet. Oh, that we would not be the reason that God won't change our circumstances because we won't surrender to Him in our circumstances. Boaz, we'll meet, is a a man of prominence. He's a man of wealth, and he's related to Naomi. Widows in this day did not have many options, no place to go. Naomi is a widow, and she comes back with a Moabite, which is not the best of circumstances because she's a foreigner, she's ostracized she's on the outside and she makes her way back and she's got to provide for her Moabite former daughter-in-law oh daughter-in-law we'll call her that though her husband has died gleaning is the principle in the law that instructed landowners when they harvest the crops to not take up everything, but to leave some behind for the poor, the widows, orphans, or those who are foreigners. This was God's way of making sure that God's people provided for those who were in the struggle, uh, those who, who were going without. Uh, it was the responsibility of the people of God to take care of those that did not have. Uh, they had to uh, leave something for them and even though that was a, a, a law, in the, in the law of God, some landowners rejected it. And so this is what gleaning is. In chapter 2, verse 1 of Ruth says, There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a great man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. Back to the sovereignty and providence of God. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35 The king says he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand. Wait a second, Pastor Richie. Didn't we talk about God's providence last week? Yes. Didn't we talk about his sovereignty a couple weeks ago? Yes. Why are we always talking about that? Because it's amazing. And it just happens to be where we are. And once again, we will see God's sovereignty in action. We'll see God move, God working in advance behind the scenes to accomplish his purposes so that he, at the right time, uh, so that at the right time his desires will happen all for his glory. In the small things or the big things, God is in control and God is working. So it says in verse 2, So Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Don't miss that. What a coincidence. Of all the fields and all the places to glean, she just happens to show up at this field. Oh, what are the odds? What a coincidence. Who knew? Oh, God knew. Oh, God knew. Proverbs 69 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. She walks out and she's like, All right, okay, I can expect ridicule. I'm going to get laughed at. People are going to talk at me, throw stuff at me. I don't know what's happening. And uh, I'm going to go to a field and I'm going to try to hide, although I won't be able to hide too much because I'm kind of different. I don't look like everybody else or I'm kind of on the outside. But I'm going to do my best. Uh, no, I don't know, that way? Well, I don't know. How about that way? No. Well, I'm going to go this way. (laughs) And she's just taking a walk. She has no idea that the God of the universe is guiding her steps. God is the supreme sovereign of the universe, and nothing happens without his knowledge or his permission. Man has free will. That's true. And both are true. 
Question 27 of the Heidelberg Catechism, written in 1563. And I am partial to the Heidelberg Catechism because I was born in Heidelberg. What's up, my people? Anyone? Heidelberg? Anyone? No. Anyone been to Heidelberg? Yes. Yes. Amen to the bratwurst. It says this regarding the providence of God. Question 27. What do you understand by the providence of God? I love this. The almighty, everywhere, present power of God, whereby, as it were, by His hand, He still upholds heaven and earth with all creatures and so governs them that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty. Indeed, all things come not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. I love that. Can I suggest that you never lose the wonder of God working in and through your life for His purposes and His pleasure. Never lose the wonder of God working His purposes in and through your life for His great glory and His pleasure. Oh, it was years ago that I was visiting. I was at the Thomas and Mack Center. This is back in the day when they used to pack out the, the stand, 17, 18,000 people. 1987, one of my favorite teams, but I digress. <laughs> Went to the game, had a great time. Yay, Rebels won. 17,000 people there. And uh, I leave, go to work the next day, get ready to go, can't find my wallet. You know the feeling. This was, bef this was before identity theft affected everyone. Back then, it only affected rich people, <laughs> right? It was like, steal his identity. Well, that was a waste. <laughs> And so, I was, but I was still worried because I had my driver's license, credit card, you know, I'm thinking, oh no, I don't know if I had money in my wallet or not. I probably did because that's back in the day when you actually had cash on you. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm bothered and I'm stressed. I can't work and I'm like, Argh. and I'm like, what am I going to do? And I don't have time for this. And, and I felt like, like the Holy Spirit just whispered to my heart and said, well, why don't you ask me? And I went, ah, right, prayer. Okay, God, look, I am so, eh. you know, I, you know, it's, this is, I'm, I'm explaining to God how much this is, this is, you know, I, I got to go to DMV, and Lord, please, no, not DMV, no! <laughs> if you are a DMV worker, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you and give me your phone number. And, um, and so I'm praying, and, and, and I, you know, I, I just, I felt, I felt the relief. I did. I mean, I felt, I felt good. Didn't give my wallet back, but I, I felt like, okay. And uh, later in the day, I get, a, I get a call. Yeah, there's uh, someone on line three for you. I go, who is it? Someone from UNLV. And I'm like, I still, I just, I just had, I was, you know, caught up in the day, and I wasn't even thinking about it anymore, which is good. Um, and I go, okay, UNLV. Huh. So I, I go, hello, this is Richard. And these, I'll never forget these words. Richard Box. Right. And he says, 17,000 people at the Thomas and Mac last night, and I'm the guy who found your wallet. I'm like, whoo! <laughs> Whoa, where are you? <laughs> I'm headed your way. Oh, yeah, that's, that's God. That's God. Don't ever lose the wonder of that. Always be amazed by the extraordinary ability of God, even in the small things that He wants to bless His children with. If we'll ask. If we'll ask. Ruth is a kingdom girl. I know that the Proverbs 31 woman gets all the press. She gets all the ink. Books written about her. 
Ruth is a kingdom woman. And she's a Proverbs 31 woman before Proverbs 31 was written. There's much to learn here, ladies, about godly character because she shows us how a, a woman of God should live. We can learn from this. We can learn from this too, men. And we'll also learn some things from Boaz. And we'll learn a thing or two about relationship between the two in this love story. Which at this point, we have no context that that's what it is. We'll get to that. She's taking the initiative. She's not saying, oh, the world owes me. Oh, she's not a victim of her circumstances. She's not blaming anyone for her circumstances. She's not depending, looking at Naomi and saying, what are we going to do? I mean, you're the one who dragged me here. These are your people, and this is your land. So what you got? No, no, she takes initiative. And she starts to work. So I, I, I have a problem with the vilifying that we see in our own culture of people who happen to have a lot of money, like they're all evil and they're all racist and it was all done on the backs of slaves. And, 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 that, and, and, and here's something. When we read what's happening in, in our culture in America, we always have to ask the question, what's the motivation behind it? And this is an example of that. Article 14 of the original Communist Manifesto, written in 1933, says this, Humanists demand a shared life in the shared world order. 1933. <clears throat> in the eyes of the, uh, so says Erwin Lutzer, in the eyes of the radical secularist, those who, acquire, uh, uh, those who acquire wealth do so on the backs of the poor. Social justice requires that their wealth be redistributed. And if you think um, globally, America allegedly has become wealthy to the detriment of other nations. Thus, America owes the rest of the world. Insert America is evil. How better to redistribute this wealth but through giving other nations the resources to fight climate change? No wonder patriotism must be denounced. You can't achieve a globalist agenda as long as American exceptionalism is alive. Well, perhaps now we understand why the secularists see the U.S. flag as a symbol of racial op racism, oppression, white privilege, and corrosive national, uh, nationalism and capitalism. And so the secular humanists of our day want the redistribution of wealth, but they don't want to work to earn that wealth. What do you do with the man or the woman who starts off with nothing and works super hard and maybe mortgages their home to finance a dream that happens to be this amazing product or this amazing company that, 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 that all of a sudden makes them very wealthy and the secular humanists of our day say, no, you can't have that because Obviously, you're racist, and obviously, you use people to get to that point, and obviously, you started off with privilege, and they may say to you, no, I didn't. You don't even know me. You don't know my circumstances, but what's behind it? When you start hearing those things, remember the two words, cultural Marxism. That's what it's about, the redistribution of wealth, no matter what, communism at its core. Ruth takes initiative. Ruth wants to work hard. She's not waiting on God. You know, hey brother, did you find a job yet? No, nah, I'm just waiting on the Lord. Here's what that means. That means the bill collectors haven't found you yet. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm waiting for a feeling. I haven't got the feeling yet. Well, you won't get it real quick, man, when the bills start coming due. She's strapping on her sandals, and she's out there hustling. And she's like, no, listen, Naomi, I got this. I'm young, I'm strong, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to glean. I don't care if I have to glean all day long. She's willing to work hard. She desires to work. She, I believe, believes that somehow God's going to provide. She's not a loafer. She's sitting around doing nothing. No, she's busy. Scripture shows us that God picks men, and in this case a woman, who are always busy 
busy where God has planted them. They're working, they're plowing, they're sowing, they're doing things. Moses was what? Tending sheep when God called him to go back to Egypt. David, when he got called to be the king, was out with the sheep, shepherding sheep. So king Saul was looking for his father's donkey when he got anointed as king. Elisha was uh, plowing a field. Amos uh, was working in the fields uh, with his plow. Peter, James, John, and Andrew were mending their nets when Jesus called them. Matthew even was collecting taxes when he got called. Ruth will work in the fields and change the destiny of a nation. If you're waiting for God to reveal his purposes in your life, don't presume that you aren't in it right now. We think the mundane and the average and this is really no big deal. Like right now, I'm only a janitor. But oh, once I find and step into the will of God. No, you are in the will of God right where you are right now. Unless you're in sin, that's another story. He's busy working hard where the, the kingdom man is busy working hard where he's already been planted. Morris Chapman was a school janitor before he was a world-renowned worship leader. And I submit to you that in those late nights or those times being alone that God spoke to his heart. There was quiet time with God that God molded and shaped him so that he could write songs in the dark, quiet place of obscurity that would transform kind of like a whole bunch of people who would be uh, closer to Jesus because of his music. Ruth was also a servant. She's not only working for her own food, but she's working for Naomi's as well. Verse 4. How many of you just looked at your watch? Don't do that. <laughs> now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And, he, and she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little while in the house. Woman of God, take initiative. Uh, uh, desire that hard work. Be a servant as Ruth was now we learn something about Boaz. Apparently, his workers loved him and had a good relationship with him. He says, the Lord be with you, and they answer, the Lord bless you. Now, I know that was a common greeting in those times, but you just get the context that they've got a good relationship, and you, know, you can tell the real character of a man or a woman in authority by seeing how he relates to his staff or what they think of her. She's also humble. She could have cited the law about provision for the poor, but she kindly asked that she may glean. She didn't really need to ask, but she asked. There's a humility here. She gleans seemingly all day. Ruth may not have known it, but she was being watched. The supervisor was impressed with how much she worked and how hard she worked. Because listen, if you've ever gone without food, that will make you work hard. She might be outworking everybody else because she knows what it's like to have nothing. May I remind you that you and I are being watched as well? Oh, you got the Bible on your bookcase at work. You got a cross on your wall. Everybody knows you're a Christian. They're watching you. They're watching what you say. They're watching how you act because they want to see Christianity in action and you are the object lesson. Peter in 1 Peter 2, 12 says, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Let your good words tell others about your relationship. Your good works tell others about your relationship with Jesus. May I remind you also that the devil and his minions are watching us too. They're setting landmines before us. They're influencing. They're pushing. They're tempting us into sin. 
And with everything within them, they want you to not step into all that God has for you. They're distracting you. They want you here rather than when God wants you there. They want you busy with this rather than busy with that. Because if they can't keep you out of the kingdom, they want to keep you ineffective for the kingdom. It's a wise person that says, I can't do that because God's not called me to that. This will take away from what I know I have to do. And the enemy will set landmines before us. Let's be wise and understand the times and understand his tactics. Please do not be ineffective in your walk with Jesus. I can't tell you what that means. Mostly it means faithfulness. Mostly it means doing the hard things and the things in, in, in obscurity. And it means fighting the daily battles and giving them over to the Lord and winning. Do those things. Be productive. Be fruitful. Verse 8 says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go and glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women, the other workers in the field. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. The kindness of Boaz is extraordinary. And this is a book about kindness, and it's about the Lord's kindness. He tells her to stay near to his field. He protects her from the young men, young men because no doubt she's a foreigner. She's an outsider. There's a lot coming her way. There's remarks going to be said. She's going to be on the, an outcast. No one's going to include her. They're going to act like she's not even there because when you're on the outside, people on the inside don't even see you. And then he provides for her. Gentlemen, hear me this morning as your brother. Hear me. Tune in right now. This is an example of how husbands should treat their wives. There's a similarity here. He says to her, stay close. Stay close. This is what I believe. Sometimes because of distraction, because of the flesh, because of we're so busy with this, that, and the other, there can be space between us and our spouse. Let me suggest that you shrink the distance between you and your wife with kindness. Shrink the distance between you and your wife with kindness. You remember that because when you were dating, oh, you were as kind as can be. Oh, honey, I broke down in Baker. I think I have a flat tire. I'll be right there. Oh, that was awfully kind of you. <laughs> 25 years later, she breaks down in Baker, and you're like, call AAA. What are you calling me for? I'm busy. Let me know when they get there. No, I'm just exaggerating that, right? <laughs> Shrink the distance between you and your wife with kindness. Be the person in your home who brings kindness. Bring the kindness. Lead your home in kindness. Be that protective covering because you protect that which you value. Provide spiritual and emotional protection, spiritual first. Be the spiritual leader in your home. Be, the, be the, the first one to pray, the first one to fast, the first one to intervene and to bring spiritual principles into your home. That's your job, fellas. You don't get extra points for that. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Be the spiritual leader of your home. He provides for her in a very unique way, Boaz does. He gives her permission to drink from the water his men had drawn. None of the other women working the fields were able to do that because water was hard to get. It took time. They had to go get their own water and bring it back. And Boaz says, honey, you drink whatever they drink. And if you have a problem, have them come talk to me. She had credentials, Boaz. He gives her beyond what the law required. Can I challenge all of us as husbands and men to go above and beyond with kindness.
I want to remind you, we don't know if there's some sort of physical attraction here. Love at first sight. The Bible doesn't say that. Maybe it was. We don't know. We want to make that as we draw the narrative. Oh, yes, the story. Of, oh, it's a man. Well, he saw her and oh, he melted. No, I don't know about that. I don't know if that happened or not. But God's up to something here. From a look standpoint, we know nothing about Ruth. Oftentimes the Bible will say someone was beautiful to look at. It doesn't say that here about her. She's a foreigner. She's been working the fields all day. So at the minimum, she's toe up from the flow up. I, wor I work in my garden 20 minutes. Man, I need an extreme makeover. Let me say this to all of us. It's easy to show kindness when we want something back. That's not necessarily biblical kindness. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, kindness. But true kindness should be extended whether or not we're getting something back. Shouldn't the people of God be the kindest people you would ever meet? I know what some men are going, <laughs> what? Kindness? Yes, kindness like God's kindness to you, homeboy, <laughs> gangster. Yes, yes. I would submit to you the true manliness in one aspect can be measured by kindness, not just by strength. It is awfully quiet in here when that air shuts off. Whoa. <laughs> Crank up the air so we have background noise. <sighs> I believe Boaz saw something much deeper. Whatever roof looked like. We don't know. <clears throat> I believe he saw something of her heart and that there was an attraction that was taking place that was not just on the outside, but from the inside. The world says it's all about the outside. Well, how she look? I get it. When I was teaching school one time, I asked the kids, I said, ladies, do you want someone to be attracted to you because of the outside or because of the inner beauty of the heart? And there was a strange silence amongst the high schoolers. And one girl in the back raised her hand and said, both. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> and now for the pop quiz. <laughs> um, the outside changes. Ladies, at one time... At one time, you considered your husband your, your knight in shining armor. Now he's sort of wrapped in tinfoil. <laughs> and he may be suffering from furniture disease. You know what that is. That's when your chest drops to your drawers. <laughs> True kindness should, not ex should be extended whether or not we're getting something back. Anyway, that was a diversion. Ooh. And this gentleman just got it. All right, yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for participating. I'll take over from here. <laughs> Where are we? Are you guys okay this morning? All right, here we go. Verse 10, because I believe how she responds to this act of kindness will tell us everything we need to know about Ruth. She has been on the outside so long, she might very well say, Sir, I cannot accept your kindness. There are people who have been so hurt, so abused, so, so uh, trapped in sin that they believe they're beyond even the kindness of God. But remember, she's humble. She's humble. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, 
It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and your land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge." Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, O Lord, for, I have, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Her kindness toward Naomi and her willingness to sacrifice caught the attention of Boaz, and he prays a blessing upon her that he has no idea how God is about to answer that. According to Boaz, Ruth had taken refuge under the wings, under the Lord's wings. It is a poetic picture of a defenseless bird who was under the protective covering of mama bird, or more importantly, the Lord. It's a picture of trust and of security. Psalm 36 says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Picture the eagle's nest up on the cliff, and it's, and it's hot, and it's dry, and, and mama eagle comes, and she spreads out her wings over the eaglets and protects them from the heat or from from extreme temperature changes and there's safety and there's refuge under his wings. Where do you go for refuge, church? Listen, you can't always go someplace. You know, I didn't say your happy place. You can't always drive down to Newport. Sometimes you have to find refuge in the moment and in the space and in the time that you are. And I'm saying to you this morning that wherever you run for refuge, you can run to Jesus. for. Re we need a refuge right now. We need a safe place with our Heavenly Father where we can rest and be vulnerable and just cry out and, and share what's on our heart and worship and draw strength from. And I wonder how many of us are running to so many other things that we're not receiving that rest because some of the things that we run to are designed to keep us there and we continue to run and we continue to run where the whole time the Lord would say, stop it and rest under the shadow of my wings. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to make it happen. Rest. Rest. You get the sense that Ruth understood that somehow. Everything that happens to her, she cannot do on her own. Only God could do this. Where do you go for refuge? Is it a safe place? Is it a place that you regret after you go there? Is it a place that you find yourself wanting even more after you've gone there? Oh no, come to the Lord. Rest in the shadow of His wings, church. Rest. At lunchtime, Boaz invites Ruth to join him and his workers. That's fellowship. That's intimacy. She's been invited to the table of the owner. She will eat until she's full, and then she'll grab some for her mother-in-law, Naomi. You get the picture that she's no longer just a mother-in-law, but she's a mom. After lunch, she returns to work. Boaz told his workers, let her glean among the sheaves the bundles of grain and to deliberately drop stuff for her to glean. I just wonder if the supervisor's going, <laughs> okay, first, she's drinking our water. It's okay, it's okay, you're the boss. It's your water. Secondly, she's eating lunch with us. Sir, did you notice that she's the only woman eating lunch with us. And did you know she's, oh, never mind. No, I won't go there. And now you want us to leave extra, extra. Some, uh, some, some, some something, something. No, no, with all due respect, sir, there's plenty for the, okay, yes, we will make sure that we're throwing out extra for her. 
just for her and whoever else might want it. We got you. Roger that, sir. All right, boys, listen up. Today, we're going to work hard. We're going to glean and reap, and we're going to leave a whole bunch of extra left over. What? <laughs> don't ask questions, just do it. <laughs> hey, sorry, I don't know if that's in there or not. It's probably not. It's not. Okay, let's wrap it up, guys. Thank you. You've been very patient with me as I ramble on. Ruth worked the rest of the day and threshed wheat that she had gleaned, separating the, the wheat from the chaff. She ends up with an ephah, a large amount for her to glean in one day. And she brings the harvest to Naomi. And her mother-in-law saw, uh, said to her, where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law... Uh, with whom she had worked, it said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And the roof said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, the man is a, is a, a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Is this the same woman who we read about last week? saying, call me Mara, because the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. The same woman who said the Almighty has afflicted me. Yes, same woman. Same woman. Of course it is. She sees God maybe unfolding something beautiful and amazing. And chapter 2 ends with hope. Naomi realizes that Boaz has the opportunity to provide for them because he's a kinsman. He's a near relative. He has the right to change everything. And the word on the street is he's single. <laughs> or should I say the word in the field? And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with, with his young women and that you do not meet with uh, in, in any other field, meet you in any other field. So she, she stayed close by the young woman of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Ruth did what Naomi told her for the next seven to eight weeks from late April to early June. She gleaned with Boaz's reapers. Lastly, I just want to say I think she was patient she wasn't trying to force anything. She wasn't trying to make anything happen. She recognized something, guys. She recognized she had nothing to offer the God of this land and the people of this land. She can't, she can't manipulate her way into change. She can't, she can't buy her. She's got nothing. She is completely dependent upon the Lord for anything good that might happen. But she's trusting in him. She's trusting in him to go before. She, she has seen the providence of God where she just so happens to go with Naomi. And she just so happens to go to Bethlehem. And she just so happens to go to a field that belongs to a near relative who is cute and single. I don't know, whatever. And she, she sees this. And she knows. Maybe she knows God's up to something, Naomi. I don't know what it is. But this is an amazing thing. And, we just, and what does she do? Ha, knowing that, what does she do? She goes back to work. She goes back to work. She goes back to doing what she knows God would have her do. You just keep working the field, and you keep working the field. Honey, you just keep working, and let God do it. Let God work in our life. You keep doing what God has called you to do. You keep working where God has. Keep looking. Keep working. Let God change the circumstance. Let God raise. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or from the south. It comes from God. If you want restoration, if you want promotion, you know what? Stay where you're at. Be humble. Let God do it. And look at the testimony of what will take place. There's no way this could have happened without God. And that's the way it should be. Because he gets all the glory. He gets all the glory. She's patient. There's a similarity here as we close this, this morning. She put her trust in the God of Israel all the way back in Moab. Oh, some might say, oh, sure, you're just following God because you're in the midst of a famine. No, it was deeper than that. She left everything behind. 
She left her former life behind. When we walk forward in Christ, we can't go back to the past. We can't go back to Moab. That's the place of famine. That's the place of emptiness. And Moab will keep you there the rest of your life if you choose to stay there. Living in Moab is a waste of time because nothing good happens while you're there. And it is a person who has been touched by God who says, I'm leaving all of that behind. I'm leaving back the pride. I'm leaving behind the bitterness. I'm leaving behind the immorality. I'm leaving behind even some of my old friends. And maybe I can bring them to the promised land of God. But I can't be stuck where they're stuck because they'll be there till they die if not for the grace of God. And God has opened your eyes to the truth. Don't go back to Moab. She was very low in her own eyes. And she found protection under the wings of God. Hallelujah. What a story. So much, so much more to come. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Father, we are, we're excited for the opportunities to minister, to share, to love, to be your hands, to be your feet. Father, that we would move on in you. We thank you for your grace in this story. It was nothing of Ruth's virtue or her talent. It was nothing of, oh, God did this because... No, it was your grace and your grace alone. And Lord, so we ask for that same grace to be upon us today, God. Lord, we have nothing to offer you. We're we're miserable, wretched, we're broken people. But by your grace, we're your sons and your daughters. And we thank you that we can love you and walk with you and that you have brought us to the table to dine with you. Lord, I pray that As your word says, if anyone knock, that you will answer and call them into fellowship. Lord, I pray for anyone who has walked from you that knows the truth, God. That they've wandered, Lord, would they they take today as an invitation from you to return to you. And Father, we ask that you would keep us in that place of humility and trust, recognizing that every good and perfect gift comes from above, traveling down from the Father of lights, and that you delight in your children. So, Lord, encourage us, strengthen us, fill us with hope and destiny and with that knowledge of who we are in Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For y'all, y'all who might want to partake in communion, we have communion elements at both ends. This is our covenant meal. It's a reminder of God's goodness and God's grace. Uh, it's a, it's um, a beautiful thing. It can be very private. We don't do it as a, as a church per se. We do it individually. And if you would like to respond to the message this morning, one of the ways we'd like to offer that is for you to come and have communion. And so be blessed in Jesus' name.